It's good to see so many people here today. Especially, it lets us know that last year we didn't have this many, but today we have more. So let's give the Lord a round of applause for that. In the African American tradition, we do take time out and recognize those shoulders that we stand. And so we do look for that wisdom from the community that we can speak, that we can share our wisdom. But first, we have to acknowledge the wisdom that we stand on. So we are looking for the elder in the community. So we're a community member. And we want the elder to stand up and give us that, 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 that push. You know, like, again, the reading, speak, Lord. You, the elder, can say to us, speak to the community. And we can then begin our sharing. So we are looking for the elder. Anyone over 65 who's willing to stand up and give us that speak community. Speak, my children. Speak. For you. The Lord is just, I don't want to serve but the Lord. So we need someone over 65. We need to be, give us that charge. <laughs> Tilt it down. This one? Which one? Which, Which one is that? See that? See that? You see that? There we go. Do we have your permission to continue this program? Yes, absolutely. It is very much Thank you. Let's give our elder a round of applause. Mm -hmm. So, we can see. Prayer. Oh. We have a prayer written by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And just to give a brief introduction on this prayer, uh, Dr. Howard told me he was 19 years old uh, when he wrote this prayer. And this is how we hear. In our Sunday reading, we pray to hear the voice of God. We hear our Lord identify himself with our suffering as we're joined with him on the cross when we pray. And for many of us, we identify with Christ's struggle, uh, his public ministry, his cross that he bore for us. And so when we pray, let us listen for the voice of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Eternal God, out of whose mind this great cosmic universe, we bless thee. Help us to seek that which is high, noble, and good. Help us in the moment of difficult decision. Help us to work with renewed vigor for a warless world, a better distribution of wealth, and a brotherhood that transcends race or color. A map of the Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend whom he goes at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has arrived at my house from a journey and I have nothing to offer him. And he says in reply from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children and I are already in bed. I cannot get up to give you anything. I tell you, if he does not get up to give them the loaves because of their friendship, he will get up to give him whatever he needs because of his persistence. And I tell you, ask 
and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. So Exodus, um, the tree leader of this ministry, serving the brothers of Constantus. At LMU, uh, we are a Jesuit institution. Part of that is Jesus himself. Another one of our you is the commitment to service of justice. Both of these two characteristics of Loyola Marymount University. Uh, we can find at the crossroads of Dr. King's service and his ministry. Dr. King advocated for the service and justice for Black Americans in America. Excuse me, Black Americans. Uh, Dr. King always focused on the love that was missing in the time that he was president during the Civil Rights Movement. He was always preaching about how we need to all love each other. We created a neighborhood where we could coexist with each other, but there was a brotherhood that was lacking within that same neighborhood. So within the book, Knock, a Knock at Midnight, there it was a collection of quotes and speeches where he basically preached about how there are values missing in the America that he lived. There are values of love and connection and brotherhood that we desperately need an American that was once there but was lost. Black Americans are just equal to everybody else, but somehow we are always put at the back end or we always had the bad end of the stick when it came to rights and equal justice in America. So Dr. King throughout these speeches in A Knock at Midnight was basically a journey of showing how he felt that we needed love and we needed justice as in everybody else. My favorite quote from this book was where he stated that America can't be a first class nation if we still have second class citizens. Mm -hmm. in, that same, in that same rhetoric, Dr. King spoke throughout the book speaking on how we always treat America as we're the best country in America or we have the best everything in the whole world, but we still have citizens that don't get to reap the benefits of everything that we see as being what is great in America. And the Constitution, we speak on how all men are created equally, but in practice, when he lived, and even to this day, that's just not what the real world is. So throughout this book, he will preach about how we all have something to work on. We have something that needs to be that we need to do better. Not just the government, or not just our oppressors, but even people that are not so much benefiting from the injustice that takes place in America. No matter who we are, we still need to love everybody equally and fairly. No matter if we're getting the short end of the stick or if we're privileged, we still have love to show each other. So a knock at midnight is just to show his journey of how we all need to be loved and how we need to show love to everybody else. Thank you to all of our participants just now and for your reflection, Exodus. As we proceed, uh, and I will do our introductions, uh, I will ask various questions of our esteemed panelists and they will share their thoughts, um, maybe even challenge us, uh, and ask us some questions uh, to respond to. Uh, and again, we welcome our online audience to participate through the chat. Uh, it will be monitored and we'll be notified from time to time when uh, those questions are available for us to make known, okay? So first, let me introduce to you, I happen to know both of these people very well. <laughs> So I'm very privileged to serve as moderator for this uh, conversation. Uh, Father Stephen Bell uh, is a missionary priest of the Paulist Fathers, currently in residence at St. Paul the Apostle Parish in Westfield. He specializes in missions, workshops, 
and facilitations in healing, dialogue, and reconciliation in these times of polarization. Most importantly, at one time, he was our neighbor in Washington, D.C., way before he uh, became a priest, so we like to think that we had something to do with the man he is today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have with us today Professor Michael Howard, who directs and facilitates a three course online program titled The Presence of Black Catholics in the Church Today and Tomorrow here at Loyola Marymount University, uh, an online certification program that we encourage everyone to participate in. Uh, the University of Dayton and, no and Notre Dame. McGrath STEP program are also online um, universities where Mr. Howard teaches courses. Uh, he also does a lot of teaching um, in the District of Columbia, Maryland, um, Archdiocese of Washington, and also happens to be my husband, which is why he is the man he is today. <laughs> And so I will get us started so that we can uh, have the benefit of this conversation, okay? So gentlemen, the first thing I'd like you to do, if you would, is to kind of share a short overview synopsis of your reaction to Knock at Midnight. Uh, what, did you, what do you feel that Dr. King was trying to say to us? And um, is it still relevant today? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you. Can y'all hear me now? Yeah. Uh, actually, did you say book? Dr. King was book? <laughs> wow. I love that. Y'all get that? Dr. King was book. Yes, he was book. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, where am I supposed to do that? Oh, no. Uh, and you know, I wish there was a way I could actually. Uh, Really break down what it means to be called at midnight. I mean, that's that's really the beginning of his sermon. And yet, someone knocking at your door at night, isn't that strange? Right? I mean, when I think about somebody knocking at my door, the first thing I think about is something going on with my children. I, I'm worried about. What had taken place. So uh, that seems strange to me. Uh, but I'm glad that the stranger went to a friend. How about that? The stranger went to a friend and he knocked on the door. And uh, yeah, a friend. But then again, I'm like, did you notice how? The owner of the house said, uh, why are you knocking on my door at midnight asking me for some bread? My children and I are asleep. Doesn't that seem like, wait a minute, you're supposed to be my friend, but you're telling me, go away. Why are you knocking at my door? So I think the first thing that we have to look at is that Jesus said that the friend will wind up giving you what he wants just because of the persistence. And I think at the beginning of this understanding of what's going on with Dr. King not at midnight, he's talking about being persistent. So throughout our conversation, we need to think about what it means to be persistent. Because some days, you, I mean, some of us may have already knocked on the door of a friend, and that friend didn't help us out. But we kept on knocking. Until we got what we wanted. So I think that's a, a, a nice way to begin. 
I, I believe that the mention of midnight is, is very provocative. It's a liminal moment, if you think of it cosmologically, that before midnight is the increase, is the increasing of darkness. And then after midnight becomes the emergence of the light. And so at that moment of midnight stands a, a choice that needs to be made. I always um, think about the scripture and think, you know, it, it is a parable, so, um, but we can definitely relate this to light. What actually draws this person to wait until midnight? to do the not. And what is the reality of that person's experience and the hoped for connection with this friend on whose door he knocks and the posture of the friend on the inside and gives the answer as it does. And I think we need to take a look at the profundity of the midnight. Uh, particularly when a lot of what Jesus talks about to us is based on the, the differences between light and dark. And this is something that, that King is, is really focusing in on in, in a very, um, with, with a lot of gravitas. It becomes a challenge for us to ask, where do we stand in? And is it, is it in the comfort of the darkness or is it in the hopefulness of the light? And to consider the fact that both have their appeals. One of the things that King says in his challenge of the church being that ever-present door at the minimum moment of our lives is that we have to come clean, if, if you will, come to Jesus. <laughs> but the truth is sometimes it can be a chamber for pious irrelevance. So we can be caught up in our own insular understanding of the Lord. And however we go to that, go to the Lord becomes, if you will, our religious bubble. But also that if it's a host of morbid class consciousness, meaning that it becomes a, a space where we can comfortably, and, and, and thank you, Medea, for this, Offer our hallelujahs <laughs> for a good half hour, or depending on who's preaching, 45 minutes. And then we go home with an emotional high that gets us through brunch. <laughs> and then as soon as we get home, the reality of our lives smack us back into whatever normalcy we cracked it out. So we have to ask ourselves. On what side of midnight are we finding, are we negotiating our lives? And we have to be honest that the dark has a growing attractiveness in our world. So if you consider the fact that it, in some folks' view, is safer, that the light demands an openness, it demands a vulnerability and exposure, if you will. And it operates by that powerful vulnerability of love. In a paradoxical way, love operates that the more that we allow love to use us, the stronger love becomes through us. But it's a scary process to let everybody see all that. And the darkness, we can hide and we can only show what we wish to show. We can wear our masks and our costumes and dress them up as beautifully as we like and give that to whoever we wish to see. Also, it's easier to manage life in the dark. The light will expose our vulnerabilities and we will have to rely on faith, faith in ourselves to be strong enough as God has given us, but won't, won't give us more than we can bear. Faith in a community in which we are intimately knit with one another, with Christ in the midst, facing a God who has sent us countless messages, above all Jesus, of victory. And faith in God, to work in God's timing and not ours. However, in the dark, 
we can draw our own borders. And we can make our lives concerns based on principles of our own resources or what we see, what we have to our own. And then we can dole out however much we wish to dole out to whoever we wish to dole it out. The other thing is control. Yes, Janet, same. Control. <laughs> if the dark is a controlled environment. So in the light, we have to take things in truth as they are. We have to accept them as they are. In the dark, we can create an environment that operates based on the way that we want things. And we can easily delude ourselves into only accepting that as the truth and never letting the greater true truth get in and have its way. So we have to ask ourselves, and I think King would definitely, as if he were alive today, and his words are very much alive today, so we can kind of think of it in that perspective, would ask, where would we rather go? Do we have to consider the reality of our lives? Is it in the dark before midnight or the light after knowing what's at stake? Um, I also just think that he would echo Pope Francis's notion on spiritual schizophrenia and challenge us to ensure that we are not saying that we are children of the light, but rather begin with an honest statement that leads itself to ongoing transformation and conversion by saying that we are children of the light who have to be honest that we like to see. <laughs> and so midnight is that liminal moment that offers us an opportunity to be more intentional about our yes and to continue on this road uh, in its brokenness towards greater progress. Thank you. Um, talking about persistence and talking about the benefits and liabilities of, of midnight uh, takes me right to the question with regard to the fact that uh, Dr. King even used midnight as a metaphor for, for many situations that were going on uh, 67 years ago. Uh, he first gave his speech in 1957 and had given very various versions of it you know, for many, many times until he um, left us. And so I have kind of a two part question. One is what are the midnights that we are experiencing now? Also, are we, and kind of what you were just talking about, are we closer to the dawn? Or are we still in, uh, what is it, the, the, the first watch of the darkness? Well, one of the things that I would say is that I'm speaking about, first of all, the beginning of darkness. Um, it's funny that uh, you kind of like, miss this, but in John's Gospel, he actually said people prefer darkness over light. Because of that problem, you don't want nobody to see. And so if we're going to be really talking about Dr. King, and I think one of our um, uh, speaker earlier had mentioned to it, mentioned about it, is that we have to learn how to love our enemies. So the beginning, before we get to that darkness, is first of all, how do we love our enemies? And <laughs> that's hard. And so Dr. King mentioned and one of his sermons, not in uh, Not at Midnight, but Loving Your Enemies, Dr. King gives us some practical steps to how to love our enemies. Now, I don't want to hurt nobody, but the first step is you got to love yourself. Can't say amen, say out. Do you know how hard it is to love yourself? 
in this world that constantly tells you you're too fat, you're too small, you're too skinny, you're not fast enough, you're not white enough, you're not black enough, you're not red enough. Do you know how hard it is that TV continues to send these messages that you are living in darkness? And so the first thing Dr. King said is that you got to love yourself. And if you're going to love yourself, that means you have to look at yourself. And looking at yourself is hard. Because then when you hear that scripture that says, well, before you try to straighten out your brother, you got to take that plank on your eye. You have to, you're going to love somebody, you're going to open the door at midnight for somebody else, you've got to be able to take this plank out of your eye. And as you begin to try to take this plank out of your eye, then you start looking at, you start becoming but they were vulnerable. To allow somebody to see all of who you are. And just when I am ready to take the plank out of my eye, and I leave the church, and you run across me and take that parking space away from me, that's what I just did. I put the plank back in my eyes. Because I want to call that person, you know what? So this is a very hard thing to do, is to remove the plank from your eye and then love somebody else. The next thing he said here that, that we have to consider is that you and I, in loving our enemy, <laughs> you have to discover the good in your enemy. Uh, you know, y'all got real quiet. I have to hit the toes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so again, after you take the plank out of your eye, if you're going to love your neighbor and your enemy, you got you can't see ugliness. You have to. It's important for you to find something good about the person that you dislike. Because if you can't find any good in the person that you dislike, then you're being judgmental and you put that plank back in your eyes. So, you know, we're caught in this idea that I'm going to, I, I'm going to love my enemy, but I got to make sure I don't judge them because if I do, I put that plank back in my eye. So therefore, I have to find something good in that person. Why not? Because God created them and made them good. The third practical step is don't throw your neighbor underneath the bus. <laughs> oh, now that's really bad. Because see, now after you take the plank out of your eyes and you found some good in them, you got to make sure that you don't throw them underneath the bus. Because if you do, boom, that plank is right back in the eye. So we need to recognize that we need to be able to love our enemy. So that's the first part of that midnight. Because if somebody comes to knock you on your door at midnight, you've got to be able to love the unlovable, even if it is midnight in their order. Midnight in their lives. And that, I think, is where we are. We talked about where are we? 
I think we're in the crossroad of trying to understand what it means to love each other. So if we can get that love out, then we can make sure that we do something that uh, he said that Dr. King, I mean, I wrote this down, that Dr. King said that the reason why we need to love our enemies is because hate for hate only intensifies the existence of hate and evil in the world. You want to love somebody and it's midnight, we need that love because guess what? When they not, you don't want to say, go away from me. So they may not be persistent. If we tell somebody no now, what no will turn away a whole bit of the so uh, the, in full transparency, a lot of my work goes um, around teaching what this love is. What is the what is the meaning the the uh, the phenomenon of occupied love and charity that we're called to show? And to really look at how we can engage that much more holistically. And that means looking at some of the factors, internal and external dynamics. Um, so that being the case, I, I have to I have to go to the psychosocial and the psychosocial king and the social psychologist, which are two different. So the psychosocial thing looks more at the internal forces that might, if left unchecked, can, can, can cause us to perpetuate, for lack of a better word, hate. The thing that I think is even more harmful is when we, who have heard it said time and time again as a first order commandment, to love our enemies or to love one another. Jesus talked as he talked ad nauseum about this call to love. When we are intentionally living in a way that turns that first order commandment into a second order condition. And we have to be very careful about uh, living in that in that space because that space allows for great perpetuity. So I'd like to look at this in turn, uh, and then I'll turn it over to my brother to look at this. Uh, internally, I think there are three things that we have to look at. First and foremost, we have to come to terms with the role of fear in our lives. There's no doubt about it. I'm sure everyone can agree that fear has been commoditized in our society and becomes a motivator in ways that can be formative. And if we allow the fear to do the driving, meaning have it color our lenses through which we see ourselves, others, and God, then we, we, we're going to always find ourselves subdued. And so we have to ask ourselves, how is fear getting the upper hand over other more uh, powerful virtues like prudence? Prudence is the reason I don't jump off the bridge, not fear. Okay, I am a tired. I don't want to like fall to the craggy box below, but that's because I think that I could probably do something much better with this life. And so coming to terms with my limitations is not the same as being afraid of it. Amen? Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, are we finding power in transactional anger more than transformative love? Okay. And this is what, what I would Professor Howard was talking about when he, when he mentions King's uh, whole piece about what's our response to the one who has done us harm. Do we 
you know, hit them back because they hit us? Or do we stop the cycle of violence by changing the game to that of transformative love? That doesn't mean being overly permissive about the harm that they've done. But it does mean changing the game so that the awareness can be bigger than the object to a point where all people begin to see their dignity more clearly mm -hmm. and to respond to it. So that's the, the second thing. The third thing is are we finding greater credibility in our pain than credence in our faithfulness? And we live in a world today that is going to absolutely take us up on the offer of being sorry for ourselves. We can make a whole lot of money and get a whole lot of advantages playing poor me. But we also know that that cycles the very giftedness that God has created us. And so are we finding the because we get the attention that we want, we get the services that we feel we're entitled to, we get the we get our way. Uh, when when we when we scream and holler, oh look at what you've done to me, versus understanding that there is a greater power and a faithful response to these things that sometimes say stand still instead of going forward. And that helps us to understand our work with greater gravitas when we understand the power of sacrifice. There might be a reason we don't get that thing. <laughs> and, and I'm just going to take a quick poll. How many of us know a good testimony about that? Wait a minute. <laughs> okay. So it's just really about understanding and can we, can we trust God's no over the desires of our hands. <clears throat> now, when we look at this externally, <laughs> I was going to say we just need to take a look at all the social ills that are affecting us and befalling us even today, three of which Dr. King talked about very, very few. I'll turn that right. Why do you think all the harm stuff to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> You know, really, because I mean, throughout his life, as I mentioned to John and his friend, there were three things that were external that King preached about constantly. You need to write them down because they're evil right now as we speak. And they're not in any particular order. But evil is evil, hate is hate. The three evils of the world is racism, economics, and the third one would be war. Those are the three of the world. And for me to talk about the external of all three of them, we would be here forever. Maybe take a class from Professor Hanauer. Go to plug and pick one of my classes. And we were talking about all three in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I have a course called Living the Gospel with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Sister Thea Folk. And we break down the three evils. But let me just share a couple of things about the three evils. I'm trying to wrap it all together. But you just start to think about it, and they all relate to one another. The Catholic Church did a document in 2018. And in this particular document, they talk about the name of the document is uh, the Open Wide Our Hearts, the Enduring Call to Love. And you got to love the, the, the topic, Enduring Call to Love. So the church wants us to love one another. And it's dealing with the racism in the church. Let's be real. There's racism in the church. 
and the white chart, natural crystal. All right, we got that movement, we got that going on, we got it in the black chart, racism is all over, and we have to deal with it. And we already talked about love and loving your enemy. But let's just talk about this one particular section of the document that I'm talking about. This is what it said in Open Wide Our Hearts, the enduring call to love. At significant times in our history, the bishop has written to express their pastoral concern over the scourge of racism, which some have called our country's original sin. External hatred. In 1958, you got a pen and pencil, write that down. 1958. You're like, I'm teaching my class. <laughs> 1958. In 1958, the bishop spoke to condemn the blatant forms of racism found in segregation and Jim Crow laws, black laws, and some other BS laws. Okay, let me back that up. I said the yes. Belief system. <clears throat> uh -huh, I got some of y'all. Uh -huh. okay. I got some of y'all. Yeah, because what? These laws, these belief systems keep on generating themselves. If you break down one system, another system seems to come up. When you get one law that takes down one particular uh, evil, another law comes right back up. If you once you get Black History Month going, somebody else want to take away Black History Month. Hello. Go on. Okay. Ten years later, we have 1958, right? Yeah. Ten years later, 1968, the church broke to condemn the standard of racism and the policies and actions that lead to such frustration. That balance and roughly in many cities. Well, you know what we're talking about. You know what happened in 1968. Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And we had the riots. And I, and I wrote the, by the Watts riots, and I think I was trying to do that this afternoon. It's a great church. Well, anyway, that kind of 68. Okay, in 1979, write that down. You got 1958, 1968, 1979, the bishop wrote on how racism still affected so many of our brothers and sisters, highlighting the structural and institutional forms of racial injustice evident in economics found in our society. Now that was in 1979. Okay. With this is the church in 2018 with the positive changes that arose from the civil rights movement and related civil rights legislation. Some may believe that racism is no longer a major affliction on our society. Some may believe that the racism is no longer a major affliction on our society. That is only found in the heart of individuals who can be dismissed as important or enlightened. But racism still profoundly affects our culture, and it has no place in the Christian heart. Guess what? In 2018, so you mean to tell me it took you 39 years to write about racism again? From 1979 to 2018, 39 years. How are you going to deal with racism in the church if you're not persistent? That doesn't sound like to me that you're being persistent. You got to wait 39 years to write a document about racism again. So if the church is not being persistent, then how are we going to be persistent in dealing with 
the three evils of the church. And so I think that's that's a lot right here. But there's one more thing I need to say and, and about this external hatred. And I'm gonna just say it because it is what it is. And that is do, do white people hate black energy? I mean, what is it? What is it that keeps us from seeing people like us in our character? Our book. The church said that the publishers need to deal with racism and reconciliation. The publishers. But whenever I look at those books, they don't look like me. Nice thing you, the great poet. He said in one of his short stories called Simple. Simple said, why well, don't see no black people on those sunny cars, sunny school cars? You ever thought about that? Why well, I don't see people like me on the sunny school cars? Why is it that we don't have in our churches images of just more than one Jesus? Why has it always got to be the same Jesus with long, flowing white hair? Help me out. I, I really want to know that. And I'm going to tell you why. Why, why. why is it that all angels, they don't, they don't look like me? Have you ever seen a black angel? And I hope I don't get fired. But. <laughs> Is there a black Madonna on the campus of LNU? There is one. One. The, the, the Jesuit community. Just one. <laughs> but you already see what's happening there, right? Y'all get the message. In, in the book called Culture Divide, Bishop. Francis said that it would be a great thing for churches to start putting up images that reflect our community. Look at this community around you. Look at it. Look around. Look at the people who look around you. How wonderful it is to see all the different cultures being represented right now. Right? <laughs> So this ain't what the kingdom of God is going to look like that we can love one another. Because when someone knocks on the door, I can't look at your color, your skin, your race, or your sexual orientation. I got to look at who? You, the individual, made in the image of God. <laughs> so when we talk about those external forces, what's happening is that we have some way for the system keeps on fixing itself. That you don't see images of us. And I'm not talking about me in general, but people of color. So therefore, you deal with, we are constantly dealing with white supremacy through our images that continue to come out. It's a fact. The day that that man stolen shot those eight black people on that in that Baptist church, when they arrested him, he went home and he drew a picture of a white Jesus. Okay, external. Evil. So if they're going to deal with racism and deal with the external 
war and what you're talking about economics, we've got to deal with the reality of what we're facing even now in 2020. So you've very well given us a, a smattering of what the midnights are, external things, um, internal positions and perspectives. I want to see if I can come from a different direction. Uh, Dr. King talked about the three loans, right? Which are the things that are being sought, right? The benefits, the, the, the good things, the, what the needs were uh, of people. He also later made mention of, and I believe it was when he was talking about some of why we're, some the churches are in midnight when he said that the churches are not actively, or if the churches want to make a change, that they should be actively engaged in the struggle for peace and economic and racial justice. So my question is this. Somebody's got to be doing something. So what are some examples of what, how the church, and he didn't name any particular church, mind you, though he did talk about uh, you made a distinction of the black church in relationship to this, but I'm just talking about now, let's talk Catholic, okay? What examples are there where the Catholic church is actively engaged in economic and racial justice or peace? Because I don't think we hear that part of the story that often, and it would be good to give light to that, and what bread, what loaves are those actions provided? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, first and foremost, I think I, I, I want to start by saying that mm -hmm. the church at the midnight hour is a beautiful um, image for me. Uh, I believe, as I'm sure we all believe to some degree, at least, that the church is very potent and capable of handling the knocks that come to the door. Uh, she might occasionally, or at least in some of her uh, of her local local instantiation, I'm sorry, I'm in a college campus, so I can use the big <laughs> Some of her local instantiations might need to remember that at least. But, you know, starting from the from the understanding that we are all in a sacred relationship with one another, and that we have a responsibility to foster that, to make sure that we are all raised up to a new hope. And when it is broken, we have a responsibility to repair it. There are many examples of church programs, community realities that actually show this. And I think that the common denominator, or at least let me just say this, from my observation and my travels and discussions, the common denominators are that these churches and programs have asked themselves some say questions. The first is, how much room have we made for the other, whoever that may be, to flourish? Not to just be a part of our congregation, uh, and certainly not to be molded in a way that compromises their authenticity, but allows them to flourish. You know, um, I gotta, I gotta use this. I'm sorry, no, I'm not just gonna. <laughs> this, this is my mission, boss. <laughs> so I always look at our, our relationship with the with, with the Lord uh, as the crucifix, and so we think about the uh, horizontal bar. That is our communal relationship with one another. That is us gathered together. This is what becomes a, 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 a very stark and powerful reality when we gather together for liturgies, for sacraments and celebrations. We become that, 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 uh, that intimate unity, as I was mentioning before. But there's also this, the Jesus and me, the self-authenticated relationship that we have. The Lord who knows our stuff and who speaks to us with a language that only we understand. And so both of those have got to be involved in this flourishing. 
And programs uh, and churches that have done that have asked the question, how much space have we made for? And to understand that there are, um, that, that there needs to be a lot of patience there. Um, um, speaking thusly, there has to be a better look at hospitality. That, there, that the breadth of hospitality has to have an openness uh, for the least of our sisters and our brothers to not just find a seat, but to experience belonging. Uh, that is sorely needed, sorely needed in our world today. And churches that do go about hospitality, ministry, prayerfully, with the Holy Spirit as the God, does this really, really beautiful. Um, okay, here's the third thing. <laughs> the gifts and talents of the people of God have got to be put into use in the church so that they're formed to be used outside of the church. That sometimes means that Sister Sarah has got to get up from the organ that she's been sitting at for 80 years and allow uh, you know, little, little Lucretia to come and to play her music that may not be as familiar. <laughs> that also means that we have to make room for the different expressions of, of language and, and, and presence and strut and plume, I always like to say as well, for the things that we do so that we're not creating a, um, a, a, a tokenism or, or B, a, really acclimatizing people into something that is not truly theirs. The, the more diverse we are, and the more that we can learn to appreciate that, the richer we will be. It's scary. Homogeneity is safety in our modern parlance. But the truth is, I think we can also understand that it's stifling, that we don't know what more there can be until we allow the truth of the diversity to come in and bless us. So that's all I said. I'm gonna be real quick. Uh, what's happening now in the church? Well, we just got finished between 3,000 black Catholics come together in 2022. 3,000 people turning away black Catholics. 3,000 came together for Congress 13 in August. That's the positive that, that inspired me. Um, we had uh, an author here uh, on the we wrote a prayer about Juneteenth, right? Very timely prayer. So if you're looking for a time to, you know, do something black in June, you now have to do something black in June by a black artist right here, Arthur. Uh, he's trying to put the prayer together for Juneteenth. We have Dr. Ken Harris in the back. You also put a, a, a book together for GAI. Is it GAI, right? G I N. G I A, okay. Yeah, I'm still working on the publishers. I got I to get on them. But yet, in that book right there, we put, they put together a collection of writings. And the title of that book is called The oh. Fire This Time. So, if we're talking about what's happening, I think there's some things happening right before our eyes. Did you think, did you not just hear my brother Exodus talk about? His experience of reading a knock at midnight. But look, the young man is talking about he's doing a men's retreat. Leaning men. In the, oh, come on now, right? You saw Kareem, she just came into the Catholic Church a year ago or two years ago, and she's up here proclaiming the gospel for him. So there are some great things happening. We're swelling up. We are swelling up. And, and John, my friend John, is, 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 he is, he's discerning right now. You know, who knows what God has for him, right? Hallelujah. Black man there, discernment. So there are some good things happening in the Catholic Church. Amen. Yes. That's quite good. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good so he also is a member of Fox Christian. My wife is president of the U.S. Fox Christian in Washington, D.C. But he's part of that as well. So there's some good things happening. 
And LMU got a course, right? They just had it, uh, you know, I think they had a, a course a year ago, uh, and I'm a part of that program. So yeah, there are some good things happening. I just want to clarify that I'm the national chair of Fox Christie USA, and uh, very happy to be a part of that uh, peace uh, making organization. And what we do all day long is justice, and ways to to be active um, with see judge and act you know not just only prayer but we need prayer and not just only showing up and protesting but looking to make change keeping people informed giving liturgical support doing uh study groups online like we are very very active in that um, in that organization working to be uh, more visible in communities of color all of those kinds of so at this time, I'm going to open it up to questions from you and from online. I don't know if you've received anything, uh, Bob, but if you have some questions that you would like to pose to our panelists, this would be a time that you can ask those questions. Don't be shy. If you would rather write it down and hand it to me and have me sit, ask it for you, I'm really happy to do that for you. Uh, but let's have an opportunity for some interaction. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, so sometimes I get nervous public publicly speaking. So I got to the podium, I must out to give me for that. But when I was speaking on the crossroads of LMU being a Jesuit institution and committing to service and justice, uh, Dr. King speaks to that because he was a man of God first and he let God's he let God's presence speak through him, through his activism. And so while he preached during his short-lived life, he preached of love as in Jesus was love. And he didn't preach uh, from the perspective of like a black Jesus or a white Jesus. It was just Jesus. Jesus was love. And he allowed that to go throughout all of his uh, preachings and his prayers and wherever he said, he showed love and showed that we need to love each other no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, what background we are. And so I think it's just important to highlight the essence that God spoke in because he didn't just preach that we should all be equal because of where he stood in life. He knows that that was a moral practice that was elevated by God's presence within his life. You know, in the book, The Knock at Midnight, he speaks on how we have physical laws in nature, as in, taught by uh, Sir Isaac Newton. But there are also moral laws in nature that come from God himself. And so it's important to highlight that Jesus and God were very essential to his preachings. And then I also want to comment on what midnight meant. It's not only the time before dawn, but midnight. Like if somebody knocks on your door at midnight, it can be unexpected or it can be very inconvenient. And so a knock at midnight, that's an inconvenient and unexpected call to justice because justice needs to happen immediately. And it may not be at times where we expect it to happen. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we have two questions. So I'll just give them one at a time. Um, in, the, in the exclusion, is the exclusion of black and brown images um, in the Catholic Church, uh, is it an omission or was it intentional? What they mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why don't you say that first again? Try to hear right. Well, the exclusion of black and brown images uh, from Catholic, in Catholic churches. Was that an omission or was it intentional? How do you how do you do it? Well, I would think that it was intentional. And I would say that because of the dominant culture. You know, the whole idea is the culture commands policy, the policy commands economics. So if you're the dominant culture, then you make policy to make sure that you continue to 
push forth your belief system, right? And that brings you economics. White supremacy has been around for a long time, y'all. And if you look at the doctrine of discovery, you'll see that the reason why they went after Africans at that point is because of the, they thought they were enemies of Christ, they call them. Like, and so I'm making it real short. So to continue to keep white supremacy going forward, you build this culture, you build this system, it's called slavery. And when you build this slavery, then the next thing you turn around, what happens? You make all the images, you make all the laws, the black code, the Jim Crow laws, segregation laws. You do that. That was intentional. And now we're trying to say, hold up. Wait a minute. That's not right. So we are rewriting our history. And we are trying to make sure that the real story is told. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that. The person who's taking the call, they are members. Thank you. The, the, the second question that comes from someone online What is the follow up to this past summer's Congress? What's next? <laughs> That's a very good question. So I would say that among the follow up efforts that I have heard about are uh, webinars of some of the um, presentations that were made. Uh, this. One of the things that Congress was intended to do is to uh, really motivate uh, for more action and to make sure that the, that, that the necessary um, story and enculturation of Black Catholics, the richness of Black Catholics in this church is not lost. And so that we might be able to engage in various ways so that we can understand that was, I would say, the ponderlet of, uh, of the Congress. And, and it does that both locally and so check with your local um, office of Black Catholics to see what you So I am a cradle Catholic um, and I lived my life in Los Angeles. And I'll admit that I've, I've been very skeptical about the church from time to time in my lifetime. And I have hope, you know, it's like knocking at the door the uh, our archbishop commissioned this uh, task force on racism, and you know, again, I'm still skeptical of that. Okay, fine, we do a task force, and there'll be something on the website. Um, that's it. But I am I'm guardedly encouraged that there is a plan. There is a strategic plan uh, to carry out um, the objectives of addressing. Racism in the church and the archdiocese. Um, uh, yesterday, I had the privilege of sitting next to an individual who is, has actually been hired on in the archdiocese to help uh, parishes. I've heard that a racial uh, ministry has been directed for every uh, parish in the archdiocese. So I'm I'm hoping I'm um, I'm being faithful to my belief that God can heal us from this and that we are doing some, I feel some concrete things to help us. And we know it's not easy. This is turning over you know, centuries and centuries of, of this is going to be hard. And, and like but I, at this point, I am hopeful. Talk to me in a year. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to know what can you do uh, to simply know about yeah. this, um, Work that's been done in the archdiocese. What are your thoughts about? Oh, mine is. Yeah. And so I actually applaud uh, LA for being one of the few in the Conference of California to.
be very serious about their work to address the issues of racism. Um, because as we probably know, there are several who could not, and then there are others that are doing good service. Now, I'm not going to be pejorative with this thing, I'm not, because the truth is there are certain uh, dioceses who just have not discovered, or at least made space to discover the resources necessary to do this kind of work. But secondly, um, can, can I address a little bit of the in a year from now, I First Corinthians 13 is beautifully said at weddings when we hear about what we need to do in order to love. I think this is what we need to do in order to solve racism as well. We have to understand that love and this level has to be pushed, it has to be. And to understand that the kind of changes that we're making is really moving the Titanic mm -hmm. around an iceberg that continues to grow. It continues to grow. But here are the here is the moment when I do believe we have to truly ask ourselves who is driving who's driving this side uh, this 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 engine this engine who's actually on the wheel is it the Lord. Or is it our expectation? We have to be very honest with that. Because there are, you know, there, there are, it's so complicated. It's so, so complicated. But to keep up the fight, stay girded, stay together, stay, stay connected for sure, and stay prayed up. Stay mm -hmm. prayed. And know that it's a roller coaster. It is a roller coaster. <clears throat> Um, yes, uh, so I'm a catechist and uh, in my local parish, and I was wondering what is the to connect to what Exodus and this lady shared, and what both of you have shared. What is the thing you think that I or any of us in the in the classroom in the catechetical classroom can teach the kids, teach the children to, like you said, build on First Corinthians 13 and also to combat the the three evils. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, start with yourself. Every candidate, I believe, must start with their story, understanding their story, and then invest in your classroom stories. Allow each one of those young people to be able to tell their story. And each one of them, as they tell their story, there's going to be a common thread in their stories. And that common thread is going to be God is love. God is patient. Right? God is caring. God is not puffed up. You create that kind of community, then everybody's going to respect each other's story. And all those individuals with their background they may have, they're going to come with a unified thing. God is love. That it's in the afternoon. <laughs> what age do you teach? Um, I actually I have an elementary class, uh, which is mostly uh, first communion, and then middle school, and then um, confirmation too. Okay. So all, all right. of the ages. Middle school and basically all of them. Yeah, yeah. Middle school yeah. for the confirmation yeah. too. May the Lord give you personal. One of the things that I've done with older kids is I have them to do exercises on servicing their values. They're very quick on being able to give opinions, but not really sure exactly where they're coming from. And so to give them the time to really figure out what it is that they're standing on in terms of. The second thing I do is I challenge them with, with some very provocative exercises that matches common sensibility with virtue sensibility. So for example, if you can get whatever you want to get from this person by beating them to shreds and making them afraid of you, why would you want to do that? <laughs> and so this is uh, 
actually from one of our one of your students, uh, Professor Howard. How do we as Black Catholics find that happy place in our churches? It takes the bishops 39 years to write or and or acknowledge that racism, racism is still real, but yet here we are. Racism and those who work hard to keep things white are the ones we are asked to love. We've, been, we've learned to love ourselves, took the plank out of our eye as we discover the good in those who hold us down. Are we to stand still now? Well, <laughs> I wish I knew who that student was. <laughs> um, I think that, let me go up from this way. When you read A Night at Midnight, Dr. King talked about how the after Rosa Parks was uh, arrested and how the community came together and they created a bus boycott. Y'all remember that? Well, that, again, the culture. The culture decided they were not going to ride another bus because of what happened. And Rosa Parks was not the first person who actually uh, sat down for me. did that much straight. But the bottom line is that so culture creates policies, right? And so the policy was made after 365 days to change that policy. They didn't change that policy because all of a sudden they started loving black people. They changed that policy because of that mean green. The Department of Transportation was running out of money. The city was running out of money and they needed the black people's money. And so that's why that policy came about. So in the book, King tells that story. And then he said, weeping you may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So what are we talking about? Being persistent. We need to be persistent. This is what coming out of the book, not at midnight. And when we deal with the racial issues and the challenges that we have in our church now, regardless of what not you may be making, we have to be persistent, right? You talk about racism and what's going to happen to you next year, be persistent. Go back to the bishop and tell the bishop, we ain't seen anything yet. We have to, well, I mean, I don't know if I talk about it, but you know, we have to be persistent. It took 365 days of black people pulling their resources together, riding the bus, not riding the bus, riding a taxi, carpooling, and doing all kinds of things, riding bicycles, just because of the injustice that was done or that was still being, being uh, put forward that you can't ride a bus in the front seat. Persistence. And that student, yeah. Uh, Darby Howard. Oh, oh <laughs> I'm going to get her. Darby, I'm coming after you, girlfriend. I'm coming after you. Anyway, let's do that later. Let's do that later. Let's do that later. Let's do that later. I was at mass with a it was a the African American priest who was celebrating, and I was so inspired in seeing him because afterwards I realized only in the Catholic Church do you see an old white man ask for a blessing and kiss the hands of a young black man, not because of his color or his race, but because of his acceptance to be of the invitation of our Lord to be one with Him in such a way. And so I'm wondering for you, especially you as a priest. Um, and especially thinking of St. Simon of Cyrene and how he wasn't asked, and, and he was not just a Jew at the time and he ended up dying as a Christian martyr, but he was an African. And he was not asked to carry the cross with our Lord. He was told no. He was forced. And so how do you, as a as an African-American Catholic priest, um, identify and help young Catholics, especially young black Catholics, identify not just with suffering, or unjust suffering, but suffering 
in union with the redemptive suffering that our blessed Lord has for souls. Amen. Amen. Um, so first and foremost is to live our greatest secret, which is our Catholic social teaching, and to understand that I have a responsibility for all of my sisters and brothers. One of the things that you will notice is I um people remark that they notice this a lot when celebrating mass, is that I refer to the congregation as family because that is indeed who they are. And every time I address the congregation, it is brothers and sisters. And it's to understand that the sacred relationship that we have with one another is not something to be taken by. It is, it's something to understand that Jesus works through. The church has been very, very clear in that Jesus shows up whenever two or three are gathered in his name, that he is there in the midst, and he's not sitting idly by. So that there has to be some way by which we can get ear and eyes to Christ that's in the midst. Particularly when there are too many forces out there that are trying to blind and deafen us to that same Christ. And we're letting them in. And so anger is one of the ways in which I become more blind and more deaf to Christ. Fear is another way by which I become more blind and deaf to Christ. I'm going to tell you a quick story about the, uh, about the obedience, if you will, if I can paraphrase what you just asked. I remember, well, two things. I was at the, um, at the uh, church of uh, the, um, my head. I'm sorry, I've been traveling about this, so I don't have to. Uh, the, the, the church where the tomb of Jesus is in Israel. Well, Thank you. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And when the Greek Orthodox brothers are there guarding the inner tomb, no one can go in except the Greek Orthodox priests. That's their precepts, and they and they guard. But we can go inside the the, the the main area. And so I went inside and I kind of you know ducked down and I looked inside the tomb, and uh, it was you know just as I'd imagined it to be. And then I remember that as I was stooping down with these old legs, looking inside the that tomb, five Greek Orthodox priests, literally, without saying, excuse me, who, or kiss my foot, pushed me into the tomb and pushed me against the wall and knelt down and started like I couldn't say one word. <laughs> Then they said their amens, they got up, they left as if I were not, I wasn't even there. And then the ship changed. So nobody else could come in. And I was there in the tomb of Jesus by myself for 10 minutes. Now, I could have gotten mad at that and said, now you done stepped on your daddy. <laughs> Okay, and, and bless them beautifully with my back knee, <laughs> but didn't because that was a moment of blessing. Yes, that it was a moment. Of I did. I had I had a moment with, with Jesus that I needed before I was ordained. The spirit rushed upon me. Yeah. So a bum rushed upon me. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is that to you know, both, uh, again, kind of going back to that. Are we responding in transactional anger or transformative love? The first thing we need to do is to recognize the Christ in the midst and see what saith thou. Amen. 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 All right. Before we wrap everything up, I'm going to do the closing remarks and all, but I know you're just dying to hear about the wrap, right? The door brought. So I'm going to ask Exodus to come on up. Close his eyes, ruffle around in here for a minute, and pick out a paper. This, this, is, for, this is for the, the folks who are here. Nice. Pick your belt. Love it. Okay. All right. Open it up. Do we have a drum roll? Come on. You all are good at drum rolls now. Yeah, come on. And the winner is Mr. John Little. <laughs> Now, before you go, back to this, I want you to pick a number between 1 and 26. Just think, think. Let the spirit. Reveal the number. 15. All right, number 15. You have a 
Or Nesta Grace. Or Nesta Grace. Yay! Thank you so much. All right. You want to go? All right. This is your prize already. His prize is a fifty dollars gift card from Amazon.com. Yay! All right. Yeah. You have to ministry. I know what that's going. Well, where is she from? Okay. Okay. Well, well you will also get one this green. What? Well, you got the Holy Spirit. Well, accepting from this investor, if you answer this, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Masari. Miss Green, if you don't see your gift card, you know where to go. Thank you all so much for your participation today. First and foremost, if you could give a round of applause to our panelists. I also just want to acknowledge Honorine Minwa. She was supposed to be here with us today. Uh, she was on the flyer, but unfortunately had to be called away uh, to um, her home continent uh, to take care of something. So we continue to pray for her that uh, all will be well and that she will return to us. Don't forget Ms. Johnson. Yeah. Oh, yes. And also Ms. Johnson, who was to have been our moderator, uh, also was unable to be with us today. So we're praying for both of those ladies that God is doing all the good things that God does for them. We also want to thank uh, Loyola Marymount University uh, for it hosting us today. Yes, come on, big round of applause. Okay, and Mr. Dixon, do you have any final instructions yes, no, for the closing prayer? Right. Uh, I won't go back. Um, so uh, we have two courses coming up in February that we talked about Professor Howard. And that is uh, Dr. King, Living the Gospels with Dr. King and Sister Thea Bowman, and also the spiritual, Black Catholics Spiritual Call. Both are starting, one on February 5th, the other on February 6th. These are six-week online courses. We don't have time really to run into all the, uh, all the, the way, there are many ways that uh, we have different kinds of financial aid and, and shared sponsorships of this. Please give us a call. The last slide has a has our contact information. Give us a call. Send us an email. We'll get you signed up. We, we hope you've enjoyed today, and I'm the Henry Scott. Well, I, I've enjoyed being your moderator today, and now we are going to close. Father Steve will lead us in our closing. This is actually a, a ritual based on the ask, seek, not, and really calling to mind our gifts as church, both locally and mm -hmm. I'd like to invite you to close up. Sister Knox, she's asking for the bread of considerate love. She, like a woman of the well, seeks someone to love her for more than the balance and the social care. She seeks for love that recognizes her intrinsic worth and is strong enough to bear all she brings to believe in to hope in her, and to endure. So she knocks in the midnight of a society that is sexualized and then used her up to pass her to the darkness. She laughs. Will you answer? A brother knocks. He's asking for the bread of belonging. He, like Zacchaeus, doesn't measure up to the expectations of others. He seeks a tribe that will accept him as he is and imbues upon him a love that will help him become the blessed version of himself. So he knocks in the midnight of a community that continually tells him that he's not enough. He knocks. Sister knocks. She's asking for the bread of faith. 
She, like Veronica, has captured the face of Christ in the miraculous, life-changing experience that she's had. But she continues to encounter church folks who discount and discredit her experience and pressures her to conform to their ideas. So she knocks in the midnight of her confusion and doubt of the white. Let me in, let me in, let me in. She knocks. Will you answer? A brother knocks. He is asking for the bread of truth. He, like the man born blind, longs for a healing touch from the Lord, in whom he believes. But others, through their words and actions, keep reminding him of his low points and his mistakes his sins and his tribulations. So he knocks in the midnight of his doubts about the restorative power of mercy. He knocks. Lord, I want to see. Will you answer? People are knocking on our church doors, seeking peace to combat wars in our world and take Others are knocking on our church doors, hoping to find economic strength to help their families. And again, neighborhoods. Some are knocking on our church doors, hoping to find love to defeat the sin of racism in the world. They knock in the midnight of their despair. You have the refreshments, brother. All right, there's the refreshments. 